Hi, welcome to another episode of the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. The show is designed for you, the marketer or entrepreneur, who may be looking for more effective ways to connect better with audiences through the exciting world of visual storytelling. We will introduce you to inspiring experts from diverse industries that bring fresh perspectives on how to capture attention, build trust, emotional empathy, and last but not least, drive business results. Enjoy the show. It's kind of amazing to realize that only 10 months ago, AI broke out to our life from the back end to the front end with ChatGPT release. And since then, you know, the whole world and his sister started, you know, talking about AI, new AI startups started to roll out. So it's kind of incredible to see all this development in the context of us uh, visual storytellers. For well, one thing, you know, marketing is a great uh, sector to start uh, using AI, both from a creative standpoint, uh, analytics, and, and also, you know, sometimes it, it even can uh, really replace people uh, when you're talking about the video aspect. So with all this action, you know, one stat that kind of caught my attention came actually from a Europol, a, a, I think it's a European a government agency that predicts that 90% of online content could be synthetically generated by 2026. So that opens up a lot of questions uh, for us visual storytelling and to help me unpack uh, this topic of how marketers can use AI to augment their visual storytelling, I'm delighted to have uh, Kathy Phil- McPhillips. She is the Chief Growth Officer at uh, Marketing uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute. Welcome to the show, Kathy. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's yeah. nice to meet. You. It's nice to meet you face to face. Yeah, I know. Our Slack communications. Exactly. Exactly. So. It's always great to connect uh, the face, and, and Kathy was very generous, actually. Recently, you know, uh, dropping my name for a, an event down in Florida Keys, that uh, was great success, so thanks again for that. You're welcome. And before we jump right in, you know, like any great story, we always curious to know about your backstory, how you got started in AI, what really kind of uh, was that magic moment that made you say, hey, this is interesting. (laughs) Well, I started my career at two advertising agencies in Cleveland, where I'm still based. I've been here my whole life, except for a few years in Southern Ohio for school. And I went out on my own for about 12 years, did my own thing. Part of the reason was I was raising my children and I just loved what I was doing. So I wanted to keep going. So I ended up just building a business from home. And the up the plus side of that was that I got to learn everything. I was I'm such a student, so I'm always reading things and learning things. So I was through the whole social media digital age. I was home absorbing all this content and kind of building my own business and um, finding my niche. And then I started working for I met um, Joe Polizzi of the Content Marketing Institute. I met him on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Turns out he lives three miles from my house, <laughs> and he was looking for someone to to help with his marketing. And at the time, I said I could take you on as a client because I liked having my own business. And within four months, I was full time with with Joe and the team. And through Joe, I met Paul Reitzer, who is the CEO of the Marketing AI Institute. Mm-hmm. And Paul and I have been friends for a long time. And in 2021, early 2021, we met for breakfast one day and we were talking and here I am. So it was just really good timing for Paul and I to get together to talk. I went to his event, Macon, in 2019, its first year, Mm -hmm. just because Joe Polizzi and I went just to support Paul and the team. And then when I left there, I was just like, oh my gosh, there are some really good applications on how I could be using AI in my business with CMI. But at that time, I just wasn't sure Mm -hmm. how to get started. You know, 2019 was so early. And as you know, Paul was way ahead of all of this. Yeah, that's incredible. And between this year, between our 2023 event or 2019 and 2023, it's just now this year at our conference, we just had people having stories to tell, technology to show. So yeah. it was such, you know, four years is a, a lot has changed in four years. A lot has changed in the past 10 months, as you mentioned. Yeah, that explains a lot because, you know, the way you guys are uh, working at uh, the Institute, it's very mind Reminded me of the CMI kind of work and the, you know, the, the annual report, uh, events. So 
So right. really great to see how you applied that to AI in such a seamless way. And, and now it all makes sense. But yeah, so before we jump right into the details of AI, this is a question I ask all my guests is how, and since you just shared that you had a long background in marketing, what would, how would you define a visual storytelling? I think visual storytelling from my perspective would be, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is writing, writing content, but a lot of, but then a lot of that ties back into making sure that, you know, there's so, there's so many words out there and no matter if it's written content, we always need a, a visual element that's going to catch someone's attention, being able to tell a story, being able to look at that picture and saying, I know what this is going to be about. And it's actually fun from my perspective. If, if I write a blog post, it's, it's, it's the hardest part for me, but it's also that I feel like sometimes the most rewarding is trying to find the essence of something visual to really tell the story of what, you know, to convey that in an image and to attach it to, to my words. So I think, you know, it's so important now when there's so much marketing out there, so much content out there, that visuals are just so important. And we've seen it, you know, with video too all the videos we're doing, even our podcast, people like watching them talk. So I think just making that, it just adds that human connection and human element to all the stories that we're telling. Yeah, no, absolutely. And definitely visuals is the, pretty much the first thing people notice before they read the captions and text. So absolutely. Right. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So going back to the Institute, can you share maybe a little bit about your role mm -hmm. and about the organization itself? Sure. So the Marketing AI Institute, we are a media event and education company focused really on making AI accessible and approachable to marketers and business leaders. And really that means we've got a media arm to the business, which is our newsletter, podcast, eBooks, white papers, research, the media company stuff. And then the education part is we've got an AI Academy for Marketers. And we have, which includes, we've got a piloting AI course. We've got an intro to AI course that really is focused on education. Some of this stuff's free, but there is a paid component, but we do have a great free starting point. And then the event part portion is Macon, our annual marketing AI conference. And then we've started to do more visual, sorry, virtual quarterly summits. So we've done a writer summit in the spring. We're doing an agency summit in November. Yep, and then next summit. year we're doing the writer summit again. We're doing a B2B marketer summit in June. And then we'll do the agency summit again in some, in some format in third or fourth quarter next year. So really, again, just trying to give, find opportunities for us to give our members, give our, give our, both our subscribers as well as our community, a way to hear more stories, bring together the people that are doing it with the people that are trying to do it and just educating each other and sharing our stories and being forthcoming on how we're doing it so we can all learn from each other. Because even our team, you know, there's seven of us which is exciting to say, a few weeks yeah. ago, there were only five of us. And I think, you know, what it's, we're all learning too. We're just learning more, a little bit more publicly. It's changing all the time. Ever. Yes. Yeah. So, we, you know, we, people say that our, you know, our company, we're experts and we may be a little bit farther ahead of, of most, of many, but we're still learning every single day too. Yeah. And I guess, you know, with all this real wind of the content development that you're doing around AI, and for marketers, from visual storytelling perspective, focusing mostly on the visual side, if you need to kind of paint a, a picture of basically use cases from, you know, crawl, walk, and run, what would you say? From a visual side of things, you know, we, like I said, one of the good examples that I use a lot is I've been jumping into Dolly and Mid Journey, trying yep. to figure instead of using stock photography for a blog post or for a presentation, mm -hmm. I've been trying to use my creative mind and go into one of the tools to see if I can come up with a prompt that again, represents what I'm, the story I'm trying to tell. So that's been fun. It's been fun for me to have something that's unique and that's mine, that isn't something stock, which is fine. It certainly, certainly has its place, but for what I'm doing, I'm trying to see if there's other ways that I can use my creativity I'm trying to test the tools there. So if someone asks me a question, I could, you know, say that I've tried it out as well. And here's yep. some cases that I've done, done for it. So that's a really easy crawl, you know, jump okay. into some of these tools, Dolly and mid journey, you get credits. And when those credits expire, you can either purchase more or wait till they're replenished. So that's really nice. 
walk. By the way, would... Dali, sorry to drop you, but Dali, I know that actually is about to release a new version. They just actually, did. In, in, yeah, released, integrated with the, the chat GPT. With chat GPT. Pro. And that's really cool. You know, just being able to yeah. um, just get those two things together because sometimes the prompts are hard to write yeah. because you know what's in your head and you can visualize in your head, but you can't put it into words. So having chat GPT to help put it into words to create the image yeah. is very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I need to start, you know, testing this a little bit. <laughs> and there's, and it's so hard. I'm trying to see if I could, you know, in my 40 hour work week, can I spend two hours a week, you know, on Friday, oh, yeah, after, things. Friday yeah. afternoons or something where I just sit down and just test some tools. Yeah. And and the more advanced one, I, I've seen some work from uh, Synthesia that it's all about this uh, video avatar that all you need to do is just write scripts and they do the delivery for you. <laughs> yes, they have that. Adobe's coming out with more things. Runway yeah. is it's a tool we talk about a lot where right. you know, used it recently where you can put in, they do text to video, video to text, obviously just transcribing yeah. text to image. I mean, it's just amazing what the, what they can do. And there's one feature, I think it's run. I'm almost certain it's runway where say I put in a photo of I mean, a portrait but I really, but the portrait is in portrait mode, but I really want to use it for a presentation. Mm. I can put that photo in there and I could say, make me a background to match this photo. So I could then take that photo and put it on my slide. And this side where I put the text matches that portrait's wow. background. So, mm. or Paul has shown in some of his intro classes in our intro classes where he types in draw, you know, a, a field in the country with a um, farm on top, on top of the hill. Okay, so you get the image and then you can say, now add to the left of it, add this, this, and this, and it does. So we can take your first main image and then just keep going, 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 all from the same thread. So you don't need to change your prompt, you just add to your prompt every time. Oh, something. I see, interesting. Yeah. It is really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. What, one of the nagging questions I'm sure you, you keep hearing from marketers is, what is the right balance here? You know, because obviously we there's on one side, you know, there we know that AI content cannot be copyrighted. Mm -hmm. And two, there's the implications of all these disputes with the artists, you know, about copyright usage. Right. So what what is your kind of a golden started recommendation for marketers who want to use, you know, visual AI generated visuals? but I uh, don't feel like they are either stealing or it's not original. Right. So I spoke with one of my friends at CMI, Joe Kalinowski, and he's a creative director. He's an artist. He is amazing at what he does. And he and I sat down one day and he said, I'm never using AI tools. This was at least six months ago. Yeah. And I said, okay, just hear me out. You know, so when he and I, when we worked, we worked together once a month, he and I would go meet for coffee. And we would do a brainstorming session on, we have these campaigns coming up, these events coming up. Let's talk about the visual, the design, the, the theme, what the, visual, what the visual aspects are going to look like. And it was awesome. And from, from my ideas, from my very, very small ideas, he would create this something magical. And I left CMI and he, someone else has you know gone and taken my role and she's amazing, yep. but she's not local. So they can't get together. Um, she's good at many, many other things, but they just weren't, aren't doing that brainstorming session. Right. So I said, what if Dolly or mid journey could be your, um, could be your brainstorming <laughs> partner where you, you know, you type in, here's what, here's what the campaign is. Uh, here's what we're looking at doing. Here's what the program is. And even if the output is awful, <laughs> it might spark another idea. Right. So using the tool to give you some idea generation, I think, you know, that's really great. And for me now, I am not JK. I am not Joe Kalinowski. I can't go in and do the things that he's doing. So for what I need, I need the tools. I need the AI tools. I'm using Dolly. I'm using MidJourney. I'm using Canva to help create images. And in Canva, you can remove your backgrounds. That's artificial intelligence. Wow. So because I don't have the skills that he has, I am using these tools to help me. So if there, but if there were things where we needed a new, a new logo design or we needed some big hmm. major branding, I wouldn't use that one because it's not copyrightable. Could you imagine doing your whole yep. entire brand AI and then you realize you can't copyright it? 
Exactly. So there are limitations, you know, like I'll use, like I said, the images for our blog content or for thumbnails on our YouTube videos or things like that. But if we were going to redesign our website, I would not mm. use AI because I don't know if, if we're ever going to own that content and why I don't want to take that risk. So if someone happens to steal our blog post um, image, mm -hmm. right. it, it's not the end of the world. So you're looking, you basically designing based on how important is the container for the final destination, basically. Just kind of the cost <laughs> benefit analysis of yeah. is it worth is it worth it for us to, you know, I need something fast, I need something, and the likelihood of someone taking it from you, it's probably pretty low. And that's okay, you know. So for us, that's okay. For someone else, they might say, no, no, we want to make sure we own that content. So then they shouldn't use the tool right now. And you know, it'll be interesting to see there's going to be cases held up in the court systems for years, in the legal system. So just seeing where that pans out. But as of right now, I'd just be really cautious on if you're using it for something you want, you know, your IP attached to. Definitely, definitely. I mean, from what I'm hearing from my friends at the agency side, they also said they use a, you know, visual generators only for kind of a mock-up for the client. And based on that, you know, obviously they go in and design the finished product. So, and I don't know if it's changed, but when I was first using some of these tools, the, the output was very low resolution. Yeah. So you, in many instances, you need to recreate it anyways, and yeah, then it but, would be, and it would be yours. Yeah. And there's on top of that, some of those generate can allow you actually to upload a base image and you can actually yes. manipulate it on top of that. So that's another We were just thing. talking to someone, I think it might've been in our Slack group actually, where someone was trying to do some product images and could they find different backgrounds mm. without having to go do the photo shoot? If they had the photo of the product, could they use AI to help create, you know, it in different situations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's still kind of a moving targets, you know, how this whole uh, space is gonna evolve because again, you know, the, the ease of use is really incredible. The results are, I just did a story and if you saw it in my newsletter, just comparing two uh, images that I created in a distance of one year, and mm -hmm. the result were completely different. Uh, right. And that's the, you know, we're talking about it can do this, but it can't do this. It's low resolution. That's all changing so quickly that we might, you know, if we come back and do the same podcast in three months, we will yeah. probably have stories to share. Completely, completely. Yeah. So now that we got a good sense of your journey and some of your, uh, perspectives about uh, tools. Can you share maybe one or two examples just to kind of uh, bring it to life for us? <laughs> sure. So I did a presentation for um, Vidyard, the um, video tool. I did a presentation for them in June. So I'm just going to share a few of the slides yep. from that presentation. If you're familiar with the Institute, one of our biggest piece of content is our podcast, which is great. We've been able to repurpose, you know, not only run the podcast, but repurpose the podcast into YouTube, into YouTube shorts, into Instagram stories, TikTok, things like that. We're just actually, I was talking to Claire this morning on our team, and she said she wants to start using some things on TikTok. So this is Mike and Paul from our team. And every week, every Monday morning, the podcast is recorded. Mm -hmm. And I use a tool called Descript which I know that many people have heard me talk about a lot. But what I love about Descript is when I first started at the Institute, I said to Paul, or I asked Paul, I said, who produces the podcast? And he said, you will be. <laughs> and I'm, I don't know how to do that. And so he said, look into Descript. You, you know, you're smart. You can figure this out. So what I, what I do is I pull the file into Descript, just the MP4. So we record on Zoom. We pull the the mp4 into descript and it comes right here on the on the left i wait a few minutes and it transcribes it what i like is that it also you can identify the different speakers and i know many tools can do this as well but what i like about that is that if i'm going back to do anything or you know we also include the transcript in our show notes on our blog so it's really it's much easier to read through a transcript sure. if you see the, if you see the people that are speaking so it does that and you know just the transcription part that's artificial intelligence and then also there's a tool within Descript called Studio Sound. So whenever we're recording the podcast, Mike is usually in the office and Paul is usually at home. Mm -hmm. So, which means they're using this, they're actually using the same microphone. They've got the same headsets on or the, and 
but even though just because they're in different places, they just sound different. So there's a there's an uh, option within Descript called Studio Sound where you just turn on, you just toggle the Studio Sound on, and it levels out their voices. It removes the background noise and it levels out their voices, which is awesome. So if there's a car driving by, or there's a noise in you know in the background somewhere in the office, all of that goes away, and the sound is just so much crisper. Where prior mm. we were having to hire someone to do that for us, yeah. now we're able to use these tools at a very very low cost every week. And then also there's a, there's a way that you can go through. And if, so this, this podcast, for example, Paul said, I forget the guy's name that was doing the interview, Scott something. So I was like, I don't know if I want that in there. Should we remove it? Mm -hmm. So the way Descript works is that you can actually, instead of going down here into the sound waves, yeah. and trying to put video, forever. <laughs> all you do is you delete the words and it clips the video. So it's, you know, so then I'm like, I guess I can produce podcasts. You can know? you change the text? Like if they say something different or different say wording? You can, yes. Actually, because, you know, we just recorded episode 64. So I've got 64 hours of Paul and Mike talking. Mm -hmm. So if a name is mispronounced or I want to, for, well, a couple of weeks ago, one of our sponsors wanted to change up their ad. So what we did was we re-recorded it and then I just edited it in. I want like, I wonder if I could have just used the overdub feature, which they have because they have Paul's voice now. Could I have um, had it? Okay. So I would actually, that's been on my list of things to go back and try to see if that would have worked. Yeah, because I think I've read somewhere in their uh, training, they say that you, you can actually train the system on your own voice and then you can pretty much use it like word and it will just turn it into your voice. Right. <laughs> Right. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, I'm sure there are a lot of features in here that I have not even yeah. touched. Well, that's cool. No, this is amazing. Thanks and then sharing. I mentioned Canva. So this is, we use the, this thumbnail on all of our podcast episodes we put on YouTube and Paul and Mike, you can tell they're not in the same room at the same time in, the, in those photos, but Mike was standing against a brick wall, Paul standing against a blue wall. And in order to make these photos look, you know, just a little more seamless, and not so, you know, just two portraits next to each other. You can just remove the background and that's AI hard at work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also, we take our podcast and we do a show notes episode on the blog. And then we also do summaries. We It's three different stories we focus on every single week. So we're able to go in and we can do a blog post on topic one, topic two, and topic three. So I use the recaps feature in writer to help me identify those key takeaways and again, I can go in and do it. I have the transcript. This is writer.ai, right? It is right. Yeah, writer, writer.com. Dot com. Okay. Yep. So they've got this recaps feature. And all I have to do is drop in either the, the MP4 or I can go ahead and just drop in the YouTube link and it will pull the takeaways for me. So a lot, you know, we say that you can't copyright AI generated content of right. any sort, but since I put in our our human content. And this recapping our human content, it's actually okay for me to use these takeaways. So I'm learning how to do this better because one thing I realized is that when I did this, these, these recaps is that it gave me two takeaways on topic one, two takeaways on topic two, and not on topic three. So I decided to go through and write topic three, which was fine. But what I did the next time was I created short versions of all the videos of each of the topics, and I did them one by one. So then I was able to take the three so recaps and morph them into one blog post. Mm -hmm. So I'm just learning how to better use these tools, which is really important because a lot of times when the tools aren't working as best they could, it's actually because of us, yeah. you know, not really knowing how to do the inputs, not right. really knowing how to create yeah. the prompts. Yeah. So I've been trying to get better, get getting better at this. Yeah, no, no, we all are. I think I tried the read.ai and in addition to the transcription, it gives you a summary of the next steps kind of a section right. so that's always uh, useful to have as well and then there's one there's this is gloss ai gloss it's gloss ai i just looked it up yesterday it's not gloss.ai mm. i don't remember yeah, okay. but so you they do takeaway you, you can do clips so what you, you do is you upload your video mm -hmm. and it the ai scrubs your video and it figures out what based on the text based on the based on the transcript it's saying this was a key moment this was a key moment versus just trying to take various sentences so it's really smart at going through and identifying where were some more poignant moments 
and creating the shorter clips for me. And I can go back in and I could look at take clip of takeaway one and I could actually edit it a little bit if maybe I want the sentence before it to be included in the video. I can just drag it. I can move the cursor and drag it up and it'll reclip mm -hmm. for me automatically. It's amazing. Yeah. It's pretty it's pretty amazing. And the nice thing about this is we use this actually for our conference this year and we were able to turn around these short form videos so quickly. So we were able to immediately say, you know, here is a minute from Paul's session, a minute from Chris Penn's session and mm -hmm. post all those pretty close to real time and actually our uh, on demand sales of our event were, were great. And I think in large part because we were able to share the content so quickly. You know, me being able to, to edit 10, 15 sessions, that would have taken me a few weeks to get through all those with everything yeah. else to do. So for us to get those out so quickly was really great. And the speakers loved it. They were so happy to see the, and then they say, oh my gosh, can we use these? And we said, sure. Yeah. So being able to repurpose some of their content. And then I also recently found a few weeks ago, another tool called Opus Clip. Mm -hmm. And we are using Opus Clip to turn our podcast into U YouTube shorts and then TikTok videos oh. where it's able to, and the same thing. I, I, we upload, actually Claire is doing it now. We upload the video to Opus Clip and it goes through and it gives me eight to 10 shorter clips of the podcast. And it's in a vertical format, which is better for, you know, obviously for YouTube shorts and for, for TikTok. And I, so say they give me 10 outputs, maybe seven of them are usable, mm. which is fine. You know, I don't necessarily need 10 of them, but the fact that I have seven versus me not being able to get to that yet because I have yeah. other things going on. So it's able to do that. I can add my logo. I can add my brand colors. So I'm just learning how to repurpose these things. And I was telling the, the our team right before I got on this call with you was that we are now, our, our numbers on both our podcast as well as YouTube are skyrocketing. And I think a, a huge part of it is our ability to repurpose all the content, get mm. it out faster, and let people know that the podcast is there. Yeah, so kind of shortening the gap between you know the production, the release, and the actual time people can get even small snippets of it. Correct. So, and you know this because you're, I know you're a listener, but we record the podcast on Mondays, or Mike and Paul record it on Mondays, mm -hmm. and we have it live by Tuesday at seven a.m. with the blog posts, with the, all of this other stuff. And I just don't think that would have be possible for us to, to turn around a news format that quickly mm -hmm. without these tools to help us. Yeah, it's incredible. And then the rest of it I was going to show you is just chat GPT. You know, I'm taking, oh, okay. I'm taking the title of the blog post and putting it in chat GPT saying, can you write me six tweets, two LinkedIn posts, one Facebook post on this topic? And I haven't mastered that quite yet, but I'm getting better at it, I'm getting better at the prompts. And I think the tools are slowly getting better, but I haven't found some one, you know, one size fits all magic bullet to us um, for our social, but it does help us again, get the content out faster. And if I'm having a, mm -hmm. a, a mental block and I just a writer's block and I just need someone to, you know, an exam, a starting point, those tools are just really helpful. Right. Right. And you mentioned a little bit about uh, some of the results you, you're getting from the, the podcast uh, viewership uh, and other channels. Can you share maybe a little bit about uh, what are the typical KPIs you are monitoring for visual stories? So for the podcast, it's, I mean, it's just our biggest piece of content. And I think there just, there are so many use cases of someone that is, you know, listening, doesn't have a podcast. I think you could do the same thing for your blog, for any other, other things that you're doing. Yeah. Um, so for our podcast, for example, we look at first 24 hours, you know, who downloads in the first 24 hours, the first seven days, and then over the course of that episode. And before we started this new process, before they changed to the news format, and we know that ChatGPT played a big role in that spike. Yeah. However, the, the the pacing is still increasing at a pretty at a pretty nice clip. So, before we started this, you're process, talking about downloads, right? Correct, downloads. We were at 200 downloads an episode for the whole entire episode, and now we're going, we're over 6,000. So we're had, we're getting 2,000 plus downloads, almost 3,000 downloads in the first 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. So. And it's just because we're going so quickly and able to get, and we're able to get out content so much quicker than we were before. Mm. I see. Yeah, no, it's insane. Yeah. And I guess for other visual content, like images, I guess that's related to where it's actually, you place them like web pages. So it's typically views engagement. It is. And we really haven't, to be quite frank, we haven't really started to measure the impact mm. on pages to, you know, we should do that. We should benchmark and say, 
you know, we started using images on this date versus our text we've been using. And have we seen a, have we seen a spike? Have we seen yeah. any type of improvement? So no, that's something we, that should be on our list of things to do. Cool. Awesome. And, and, and I'm sure you also, when you talk to marketers and share some information about uh, the proper way to use AI, do you share any guidance about risks, things they should watch out for? Yeah, I think the way we encourage folks to get started is don't look at the tool, try to figure out what you're trying to do with the tool before you even select one, you know, mm -hmm. is, do you have a use case? And for yeah. example, my use case was very simply, I don't know how to produce a podcast. So what am I trying to do? I need to edit. I need to correct, correct the sound. I need to write the blog. So here's my 10 things I do every single week. Actually, it's 30 steps because I documented it. And people are going through and say, okay, AI can help us here. AI can help us here. Let's go find a tool that can do that. Mm. So that's been, so figure out, you know, we, Paul has a, a spreadsheet he uses in his presentations. And it basically says, write down all the tasks you're doing for a certain problem. Mm -hmm. And then say, what is your, what is the value to intelligently automate it? And wh what is your ability to automate, uh, to automate it? So you rank one to five and you try to see where are they in five in both places and then start there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know which tool to start with, you can go to our website or you can simply Google AI and podcast pr production, AI and, you know, videos and things like that, where you, there are tools that will surface. I think G2 is getting a little better. You know, if you know that yeah, yeah. Descript is a tool that you've heard about, you like, I wonder if they have any competitors. I think G2 is getting, you know, some of those tools in there more and more. And then... I think that's really the starting point is instead of saying, oh, someone's using Jasper, great tool, don't get me wrong, yep. but doesn't everyone should be using it. Figure out what problem you're trying to solve. Is one of the tools better mm -hmm. at informational copy? Is one better at creativity? Is one better, you know, mm -hmm. or simply which interface do you like the best? So, so many of the tools have free two week trials or even just free versions and just play around with those and try different, try them. You know, there are sometimes I actually have Bard, ChatGPT, Claude open at the same time it, with a sorry, a fly just went by my yeah. head and seeing which ones give me the output I'm looking for. And it's never, ever the same one. They all have their, they all have their strengths. Right. So just testing out some of these things over and over. Yeah. But in terms of categories, it looks like content management is kind of the low hanging fruit to get started with. I think it's just the most tangible. Yeah. And the, I think, I think, you know, Chat when Chat GPT came out, people were like, "Oh, that's artificial intelligence." I didn't yeah. realize, that and I, I actually could be using it. So whether you're writing blog content or writing sales emails or whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, I use it sometimes to fix my Excel formulas. I will type in the formula that I think it should be, and I, I will say, "Here's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. What am I doing wrong?" And I usually it's like adding a comma where I don't think a comma. Oh, needs to be. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah. it doesn't that's always that's need to be generating. Mm -hmm marketing copy you know you can right. use it for of reasons yeah summarizing copy polishing yeah and i was then... talking to a local enterprise and they were talking about i said do you ever use transcription for your interviews and they're like oh no 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 we don't do that and i said but just think if you were if you were doing an interview mm -hmm. you were talking to someone and you were trying to write down their notes trying to write down their quote and making sure you got it right wouldn't it be so much better if you were just able to actually be in the interview, listen, yeah. just record the, inter record the interview, be fully engaged, not try to do two things at once. How much of a better interview would that be if you could spend that time really focusing on the person you're talking to and less about trying to get all the content and just record it and get the transcription and then use that to write your, and then use that to write your content. And then you summarize basically and kind of edit it after the fact instead right. of editing in real time, so to speak. Correct. <laughs> And half yeah. listen, you know, you've invested, this yeah. person's invested their time with you and you just want to, so, you know, use those, use these tools to our advantage. And it still needs a super hard edit. You know, it still needs the humans. Sure. We still yeah. need the artists. We still need the visual experts. Paul needs a speaker reel. You know, obviously just in this time, he's been asked to speak a lot and his speaker, he doesn't even have a speaker reel. So he said, mm -hmm. can we do that? I said, no, we need the experts to do that. That's something that I can do the day to day. I can edit words and clip a short sure. video. But for the big, highly produced videos, the professionals need to be need right. to be doing. Those. Right. And still speaking about the creative content that you typically work with, do you have a protocol to kind of 
mitigate uh, risks of uh, falsehoods, you know, issues with accuracy, uh, copyright, bias? I think, you know, I don't, that I don't know. So Jasper, kind of going around your question a little bit, but Jasper has written a generative AI policy they have on their website. Um, there are a couple other ones we look at to say like, are, is our company doing the right thing? And some, and some of those things are, have we gone through the tools that we're thinking about using and partnering with? Have we read their terms and conditions? How are they mm. using our, how are they using yeah. our information to make sure that we are doing our due diligence? Yeah. Lawyers, IP lawyers are, it's a great field to be in right now. Yeah. <laughs> Just because we're all trying to figure this out. But to go back to your question of, you know, how do we protect ourselves and how do we know what we should be using? It's just, everything's changing so quickly. So we err on the side of caution on how we're using our content. I don't know if you've ever heard Paul say, but f four of us on our team, I'm not sure about the new, the, I can't think about the, the two new, but, but we're journalism majors. We're writers. We yeah. like writing. Yeah. We yeah. like creating. So we're not using AI to write our content. We're using AI to help us repurpose and distribute our content. And every oh, now and then we use it to get it, we'll use it to, or as a brainstorm or something, but to, you know, to write a blog post we love, we're not using AI for that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I think it's really taking away, you know, this inspection of also creating something you proud of, something you believe in. Because in my mind, I kind of thinking out loud, you know, kind of fast forward a couple of years, you know, when AI is going to become much stronger, adoption is going to go up. There's a good chance that you know marketers probably going to be mixed crowd of some of them that using exactly like you said very balanced approach of okay I'm going to brainstorm with the tool but actually have a my hand on the wheel to produce the my personal touch but there are going to be another camp that's going to I call them the copy and pasters <laughs> basically going to use the tools you know why work hard I want to but I think those are the folks that have been writing. To, for search engines instead of writing from their heart anyways. You know, the people that yeah. have been trying to, to, to work the system and trying to rank higher by writing mm -hmm. adequate content to rank, those are the people that are going to be trying to cut corners with AI. There, you know, there are so many purists out there who are yeah. need, to, need to start tinkering with these tools and figuring out how it can they can work alongside the tools. And those are the ones that are going to succeed. If we're getting outputs from these tools, the humans are going to be the ones that are going to be making the difference adding our personal touch, adding our words, adding our voice, yep. adding our creativity. That is so, so important right now with all of this technology. Right. And, and, and visual, you know, visual is no exception. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And interestingly, you mentioned the search engine ranking. Obviously, AI has a huge uh, kind of looming shadow right now on the search engine sector. What's your take about that? So Andy Crestedina, do you know Andy? Yeah. At Orbit Media, he just wrote this amazing blog post on using ChatGPT for SEO, and it is absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. So I'd highly recommend looking up Andy's Orbit yep. Media article. And he just talks about how to use it, how to help you think through some things, how to generate some some copy, what it means, you know, and how to measure your results. Mm -hmm. So I can't even speak as highly. I can't even explain it as well. You know, I, I was thinking more about uh, not about how to use AI to kind of accommodate the existing search engines, but if you do, if you see kind of a transition point where people will start moving more towards the AI tools, like why go sift through like a million search results if I can get one answer right. and keep refining it. So what happens to our, you know, SEO? Is it gone or is chat GPT of Good the question. world will become more you know SEO? It's gonna be we have to learn AI SEO. <laughs> Because the I mean, tools you're right, because you know, if you think about when you go to a chat GPT, it's giving you an answer. When you go to Google, it's giving you 10 links to search, you know, the other hundred thousand links to search through. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, and I think they're gonna have to keep training these models. You know, if they don't refresh the the, the models, then we're going to keep we're going to need Google. And I think Google recognizes that that's going to be that that's so they're trying to iterate and are are updating their things and you know, BARD is available and so that yeah. We, I just wrote some. I just read something yesterday about when will these tools, when will these large language models refresh and update their content? So I don't know if some of it, some of it is through the things that we're putting into the into these tools. It's learning from us. So I don't know. 
Yeah, um, I've been using a perplexity, and what I like about it, it gives you like the links for where you got the information from, so you can a validate it and b you know someday it's maybe it's SEO worthy. <laughs> right. Besides, gosh, my friend Beth loves perplexity. Yep, she said it's absolutely amazing. Yep. Now you did bring up a good point about you know research and accuracy of some of these outputs. You know, if you're writing something and you're to, and you're looking to do research. I would not use the tools because oftentimes you'll get results and even the results that will have citations and they're made up. And the broken links, you get often broken links, even yes. if the link is active. Right. <laughs> so that's incredible. Yeah. One of the things that really fascinated, fascinated me, you know, in your recent uh, annual report was that, and Paul actually addressed that in the fact that you actually, your audience is actually well-advanced uh, marketers in the AI adoption process. So it's already kind of skewed towards that audience. So early adopters. So what was kind of uh, intriguing was that the number one issue they faced, it was really that blocking them from adoption is the education and training. Right. So what do you think about where we are? I mean, it's kind of, you know, AI is constantly moving and even the people that are using it are not really covering the, the whole spectrum. <laughs> it's interesting. So I was talking, I was looking at some research. So our, you know, we've got, again, to your point, we sent out our survey to people that we knew, you know, our 50,000 subscribers and yeah. members of our community, people who follow us on social media, who have, who have an inclination already, an interest in artificial intelligence. Yeah. And so we had, you know, our, the jump from beginners to intermediate and those that consider themselves advanced increased this year, year over year. I was talking to someone else about their report that they did, asked a similar question, not the same, but similar. And they said marketers were just getting started. And I was talking to someone else who had a research report who talked about business in general and that market the marketing departments, because they had ops, they had sales, R&D, you know, finance. And marketers were the lowest ranking, you know, as far as AI usage. So we, you know, we show it higher on our end, obviously, because we are mark, we are yeah. getting survey responses from those who are following the Marketing AI Institute. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. And I, but I, but I do think to your point that th there were a lot of C-suite, a lot of CMOs who took this, who took the survey, who basically were saying we're interested. We know we need to do it. We either don't know where to start, we don't know how to find time to start, how can we make sure that we're getting the best information? And oh, by the way, I have 20 other things I need to get done by five o'clock. So a lot of it is time on their part and just making the making the initiative, taking the initiative oh, to, it, to do this. And I, outside the practicality of time allocation, have you encountered any other kind of misconceptions that marketers might have? You know, there's definitely the is taking my job you know, yeah. concern. And we try to, you know, mitigate that as much as possible saying, mm -hmm. you know, what I mentioned earlier is that if you look at some of the outputs from some of these generative AI tools, marketers are needed more than ever. Humans are needed more than ever. And, you know, we're, and then we, but if we, we we're going to have to reskill at, at some point, you know, yeah. we're going to be using these tools and we're going to be saving so much time or it's doing these things, especially like data analysis. It can do data analysis so much faster than we can. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we are we are protected and safe in our jobs. Yeah. So sure. it's going to be reskilling us, reskilling our roles, reskilling ourselves, trying to figure out, you know, now that I have five extra hours a week, what can I be doing? Can I be more strategic? Can I be more creative? Can I be talking to customers more? How can I be reinvesting that time to be the most valuable in areas where AI won't be able to help me? And when we were hiring our two um, recent hires, Claire and Noah, we did go through their job descriptions because we wanted to make sure we were mm -hmm. saying that up to succeed. We didn't want to hire them and then realize, oh, in six months, we actually didn't need them and have to get rid of them for some reason. So right. we want to make sure Yeah, is they're essential, basically. And securing their job for them. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So, you know, with all your mileage uh, with AI so far, you know, any thoughts about uh, what uh, the future will bring and how it will affect visual storytelling? I, you know, I think the next big thing that I'm seeing is, you know, a lot of companies focused on bringing a lot of the tools 
getting their own versions of the tools mm -hmm. to, to protect their own IP, to protect their data, to protect their assets. And to your point about visuals, you know, if if there is this library of all these visual elements that your team has put together and you want it to train off of your, you know, your visual elements, that would be amazing. So it could help you without it training somebody else, without your competitors seeing what you're doing, having access to all of these things. So I think that's going, I think that's going to be the next big thing. And I haven't seen it from a visual side of things, but definitely from a generative AI side of things from a copy standpoint. So I could definitely see that something. And I feel like that would be really helpful to a lot of, to a lot of companies. And, you know, artists aside, if there's a brand look, a brand, you know, tone that you are trying to go with in your images mm -hmm. and you have various people working on this, what a great thing to be able to have a tool that could help you streamline a lot of those things to have them have the same look. So that would be really, that would be really nice. It's basically a, like a custom database around the company's own historical data. Right. Not really exposed to in the wild internet. <laughs> Yeah, and then I know I've been talking to um, a tool, um, a digital asset management tool, who is trying to embed more AI into what they're doing, and what an opportunity for us to tie visual elements to KPIs, to results, to you know usage of that asset, and get it bringing all of that back together in a more because a lot of that was so manual in the past. Yeah, well, how could AI be helping us? Do all of that so we can really be focusing on what we love creating sure. and so the last time we're trying to analyze and make sure we tag something the right way or you know all those things it's just going to save us a lot of time on on the rote repetitive definitely. things that we've been doing definitely so to close our chat you know this is a question i'm sure you're getting all the time you know <laughs> what you say is your top three tips for you know marketers who want to start with ai to kind of augment their visual storytelling responsibly well, I would say you're not behind yet, but you're going to be soon. So start doing something, mm -hmm. start looking at some of these tools. So that's my tip. Number one is jump in. Tip number two is find a use case, find a very simple use case. I want to A-B test subject lines. I want to A-B test a uh, header image on an email. I want to any of the, you know, find, find one thing and then go find a tool. And if you'd spend $10 for that first month, or it's free for the first month, just it's worth the investment. And three, think about this, think about it holistically. You know, we were talking to someone about our podcast and with all the tools we use, we spend about a hundred dollars a month. And someone said, I don't have a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. And I said, we save 68 hours a month by my calculations, by using this tool, it is worth a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So yeah. looking at don't, there, there are some tools that are very expensive. You know, you don't need to go to the most expensive thing. Sure. But seeing a few dollars to save a lot of money and have some really great results is worth it. So think bigger picture than just that first price point. Yeah. And look around, you know, there join a community. We've got a community. I know there's lots of other communities out there, but talk to people about what you're trying to do. One of the best things about the group that we're in is someone says, I'm trying to create some images and I'm using this tool and I'm getting this output. Is there a different tool or am I using it wrong? Or does anyone mm -hmm. have any advice? Yep. And you'll get two responses from different people and they're all different and they're all valuable in their own way. So we're all learning from each other and just ask questions, ask for help, cool. ask other people how they're using it. And we're all kind of in this together right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. We are actually shaping the future together. We are. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Very cool. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. This was phenomenal. You know, I always uh, learn so much from you and from the Institute and if people want to ask you or contact you for more questions, how they can reach out. I'm worth marketing AI Institute.com and you can find me on LinkedIn, Kathy McPhillips. And we're pretty, you, you, you can't miss us. We're, we're, <laughs> you can find us easily. Yeah. Just so for those who have never heard about the Institute before. <laughs> so, <laughs> very cool. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a lovely time chatting and dissecting. And yeah, I hope uh, everybody listening or watching, uh, stay tuned for the next episode of the Visual Storytelling today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Visual Storytelling Today is recorded in Miami, Florida. The show is published exclusively by Visual Storytelling Institute. Learn more at visualstorytell.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on the iTunes Store. Until next time, don't let your big story wait to be told.